with my father and mother. And that put me down the road because of the teaching and the training that I have learned for them. My mother spends my birthday, which was last Friday the 12th. She was here from sunup to sundown, and she's done that every year. I'm blessed. She's always touched us. And this morning, she has a message that once again is going to challenge and change our life. Mother, come speak to us what the word of the Lord says to us. Because of the times, 2007. I am a revival vessel. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. I am a revival vessel. time to talk 1,000 hours, I could not express the goodness of God to me. He took me as a very young girl from the cotton fields on the backside of Gibsonville, Texas, where I dreamed of this day. He joined me with a great, great man of God to preach the only saving gospel of Jesus Christ. For this and this day and this hour of this day as I once again privilege to speak at Because of the Times for the 24th time there is a peculiar gratitude though in my heart today. God be thanked for every experience and every opportunity to proclaim the matchless name of Jesus Christ and His gospel wherever that may be. For there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's a powerful motivation to me. And so I say thank you. You may be seated. Jim Elliott was one of the five radical missionaries who was killed with spears by the Aucas Indians of Ecuador back in the 1950s. Several months after Jim's funeral, a friend of the family approached his widow Elizabeth and asked, how do you deal with Jim's death? The fact that he was brutally killed with a spear that day in the jungle. Where he died and the way he died, how do you handle that? Elizabeth looked the friend straight in the eye and with little hesitation she said, My Jim didn't die in the jungle that day. My Jim died one night in high school while he knelt by his bed in agonizing, travailing prayer and prayed this prayer. Lord Jesus, if you did all that you did for me that is written in thy blessed holy book, then there is nothing I can do for you that will ever repay the debt I owe 
So I commit myself here and now to go and do whatever you want me to do. I'm yours. Do with me as you please. Then she paused and said, That's where, that's when my Jim died. Because of the times 2007, you can't mock that kind of true devotion and sacrifice. Wherever you find it, it grabs you. It challenges you. It indicts you. It demands a verdict of you. William Booth and his wife Catherine, founders of the Salvation Army, their passion for the lost especially those who were considered irredeemable, was legendary. William and Catherine Booth dedicated their children to the same work God had called them, that of loving a lost and hurting world to Jesus Christ. His passion was, go for souls and go for the worst. We must do it. We have no alternative. We exercise no prerogative. Our happiness must be in sharing their misery. Our ease in sharing their pain. Our crown in helping them bear their cross. And our heaven is going into the very jaws of hell and pulling them out. Now I'm not here today suggesting that we become a Jim Elliot or a William and Catherine Booth. But what I am strongly saying today is, where there, there must be among us a passionate, quenchless passion for souls on purpose. On purpose. On purpose. There must be a renewed intercession for the lost. Like the anguished cry of Jesus as he wept over the doomed city of Jerusalem. Like the cry of Paul saying, I could wish myself accursed, anathematized from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Like the heart-rending plea of Moses, Oh, this people have sinned, O oh God. Yet now if thou wilt forgive thy, their sin, but if not, you just blot me out of thy book which thou hast written. Or like the cry of John Knox, it ought to rise up in this place today. Give me Scotland or I die. Or like John Wesley crying, the whole world is my parish. Or like Billy Sunday crying, Make me a giant for God. Or like a parent in the night weeping over prodigal children. Or a spouse agonizing over an estranged companion. But there must be a burdened, anguish cry of lost souls coming from preachers, churches, altars, prayer rooms in this state, in this nation, and around this world. It's got to happen, say, on purpose. That's what would bring the revival we're all dying for. It's not the only thing, but it's the first thing. The question was asked of someone who was present at the Azusa Street Revival. In your judgment, what was the act outstanding spiritual phenomena of the Azusa revival. The reply was, without question, in my own judgment, from the spiritual standpoint, it can be answered in one word, namely, tears. He said, I've been a Christian since boyhood. My observation has been that hardness of heart is probably the greatest single obstacle and hindrance to revival. He said the Azusa revival began where every revival should begin, in repentant tears. 
He said it began in tears. It lived in tears. And when the tears ended, the Azusa revival ended. Because of the times 2007, with as much compassion as I can say it, we all need, as the old timers would say, a good old Holy Ghost praying through. A good old breaking up of our fallow ground. Weeping between the porch and the altar with tears of confession. Tears of humility and brokenness and contrition. Crying out, I will not let you go until you bless me. I pray it happens that because of the times 2007, I wouldn't care if it broke out right now and I never got to finish this. It needs to. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nehemiah, that great statesman and patriot said, when I heard of the desperate, disgraceful, and dangerous conditions of, of my city, my people, my nation, I had to sit down. It knocked the breath out of me. A paroxysm seized me. I wept. I mourned. I agonized. I fasted. I prayed. And that's how I rebuilt. That's how I revived. That's how I restored the broken down walls of my city, Jerusalem, against all opposition in 52 days without any sophisticated equipment. King David, the greatest king who ever sat on Israel's throne, the man who was raised up on high, Brother Willoughby, the man after God's own heart, the sweet singer of Israel, whose lineage was established forever, said, I watered my couch with my tears. My tears have been my meat day and night. My tears were foundational to Israel's glory and fame. My tears gave me rest from all of my enemies. And they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And he that goeth forth and weepeth, sharing and bearing his precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. A weeper, a warrior, a worshiper, a worshiper, a weeper, a reaper sums up the life of the king whose throne Jesus Christ shall be given and, his key, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's what the angel told Mary. And God said to Isaiah, you go tell Hezekiah, I've heard his prayers, I've seen his tears, I'm going to heal him, and I'm going to add 15 years to his life. Jeremiah said, deep in your heart because of the times, 2007, you have prayed and you have cried to the Lord. Now, let tears run down like a river day and night. Give thyself no rest. I'm going to heaven tired. Get up and pray for help during the night. Pour out your feelings to the Lord as you would pour water out of a jug. Beg Him to save your children. Beg Him to save your family. Beg Him to save your people. And don't ever quit. Persevere until you bring revival to your church like we're all dying for. that we could hear the anguished cry of Jesus as he weeps over the doomed city of Jerusalem. Fifty days later, though, Pentecost, a revival that has lasted almost 2,000 years. Humbly I ask, how long has it been since you wept over your city, over your family, over your church, over lost souls, over those who have gone astray. Tearless hearts can never be the herald of the passion of revival. The Bible pattern, 
when Zion travailed, then she brought forth her children. A dry-eyed church in a hell-bound world will never have revival. It's markedly abnormal. It doesn't even make sense. You'll never save souls. You'll never spare your children. You'll never save your young people or keep families and homes together. We need a good old-fashioned breaking up before God like we've never had. The very facts, hear me, of the incarnation and Calvary tells me that every man is worth something to Almighty God. Man, his crowning creation. Man made in the image of God. And you'll never look a man in the eye who is not, who does not bear the image of God. It is written, God magnified man. God set his heart upon man. God visits man. And I say, the redemption of man is big business. It's the theme of the whole Bible. It's God's business. It's the Father's business. Keep it that way, preachers, gentlemen of the cloth, and your church will grow, and you will never lack for a congregation. It starts in the pulpit. It flows down to the pew. That's the reason for the growth of great churches. Evangelism in the pulpit. Evangelism in the Sunday school. Evangelism in the city. Evangelism everywhere. It is the soul and spirit of every organization and endeavor of the church. Where they have failed to win souls, they have died and they're dying and they will keep on dying. Because we are found to find others. We are told to tell others. We are one to win others. We are saved to save others. So if you've come to Because of the Times 2007 looking for answers, that's your answer. That's the Bible answer. That's the Jesus answer. You can do better than that. If that's what you came for. Redemption business will never change. Will never change. So that's the only thing that will change our cities, our churches, our homes, our families, and bring the revival we're all dying for. That's how men and women have left a legacy that has marked a generation, a church, a family, a town, a city, and yes, a nation. And that's what will reshape the spiritual landscape of a generation that is overdosed on things. Things that will rot and rust and decay. And I've heard it preached and I've heard it sung. We're going to a higher level. With all of my strength and Christian experience of 81 years, and as forcefully and convincingly and persuasively as I can say it, it will cost, it will cost to take it to a higher level. A cheap, flaky, shallow, slipshod, visionless, burdenless, tearless, prayerless, self-centered, and a crossless Christian philosophy that permeates the landscape of modern church culture today will never, ever, never, ever take it to a higher level. You can't build a skyscraper on a dollhouse foundation. I'm going to say it again. You can't build a skyscraper on a dollhouse foundation.
It will take more than our beautiful anointed music. It will take more than all of our challenging and impacting conferences, even because of the times. It will take more than our colorful and excellent websites. None of these alone is sufficient catalyst to take it to a higher level and bring the revival we are all dying for. Something far greater is required. So, what will it take? As for me, it will take joining the ranks of the uncommon men and women whose lives are lived so devotedly and dynamically that they are dangerous to Satan's kingdom. They are the company of the committed, the lead compete, the few on fire, who love not their own lives even unto death. They'll march to the very jaws of hell and pull people right out of the burning no matter who they are. <laughs> Hear me. That's what this generation is looking for, ladies and gentlemen. They're crying out as did the Greeks to Philip in John 12 and 21. Sir, we want to see Jesus. It's not what you're saying. We want to see the man you're talking about. They want to see Jesus. Show us some Jesus. They're looking for followers of Jesus. Is everybody awake in here? They're looking for those who will live as Jesus lived. Pray as Jesus prayed. With strong crying and tears. Until others will cry out, teach us to pray. Who love people and love people and love people and love people unconditionally. No matter what they look like, smell like. Welcome them regardless of their ethnic background, color, race, or creed, or anything else. Forgive them as Christ forgave, and not be willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. From the guttermost to the uppermost. I'm not willing either that any should perish. Not one. No, not one. Not one. I wouldn't want an animal to be burned forever. We're mandated by the Great Commission to be just that. If I'm crossing your theology, that's good. I intended to. We're to write new chapters in the book of Acts every day. Filling our cities, our towns, our villages, our hamlets with apostolic Jesus name doctrine confirmed from heaven with miracles, signs and wonders. Because at the times 2007, that's what this generation is looking for. We want to see Jesus. Let me see you do some of it. Show me. I want to see it. Our senator of many years, Charlie DeWitt, whose son is the leading cardiologist, heart specialist in this city. Last week while I was praying for Anthony and Gentry's birthday, along about 2 o'clock I had decided to lean up against the altar there and Charlie walks through the door. And I look and I thought it was one of our men and he said, this is Charlie. I said, come on over here and sit down by me, Charlie. And he got just as close to me as he could. He's in Houston today. And he said, Sister Mangan, I went by the house looking for you. And when I couldn't find you there, I knew where to find you. I said, that's what this, that's what this generation's looking for. They may never join this church, but they're looking for people that's got something that they need. Hey, everybody awake, saying, we've got it. Show me some of it. He said, I was just found with cancer in my lung. He said, I'm headed to Houston. I said, well, your son can get you the best international doctor. He said, he has. I said, well, Charlie, I don't know how to do many things very well, but I try to do this one thing very well. He said, well, do it for me. And he said, I'll be back. How can we stand by idly and do nothing? 
while the forces of evil are ravaging and sodomizing our cities, ripping our homes apart, capturing our youth with dope and alcohol, D disease and war and wicked violent crimes are wiping out this generation. Professors of religion are humanizing Jesus Christ and secularizing the gospel and streamlining sin and denying the infallibility of the Bible and the virgin birth and the supernatural. But in the midst of this religious apostasy and ever-changing world, when evil men and seducers are waxing worse and worse and darkness is covering the earth and gross darkness the people, I'm happy to announce to you the apostolic Jesus name, book of Acts message, never ever changes. Say it with me. Say Acts 238 is as relevant and active today as it was 2,000 years ago when it was first delivered on the day of Pentecost. And indulge me, please. It belongs to the whole world. I didn't say it. Jesus Christ said it. He said every creature in the whole wide world deserves a chance. God knows and you and I know we are not telling it or publishing it like we should or like we could. And the apostolic question has been asked, how can they believe on someone of whom they have never heard? Now hear me. I'm like the girl in the Civil War days. The Yankees came down to her farm she grabbed a broom out of the kitchen and started swinging that broom, running toward the Yankees. Somebody asked her, where are you going? She said, I'm going to fight the war against the Yankees. The person said, you, you can't win the war swinging a broom. She said, I may not can, but I can sure let them know whose side I'm on. I've come here today to let you know whose side I'm on. I'm for winning the world, and I'm starting on my own premises. Just for the sake of the record, if that's all I've got, and if that's all I can use, I'm going to keep swinging my broom. You better get out of my way. I'm going to be swinging my broom. I'm going to let the devil know whose side I'm on. And I'm going to let this lost, hurting world know that I love them. I love them. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to love them. Let every minister's wife under the sound of my voice know this also. The devil hates you. It was the woman's seed that crushed his head. His headquarters. So I say to you today, just get a new grip on your broom. <laughs> and just keep on swinging your broom. You've got some mighty weapons that can knock down the gates of hell. And I'm not on a cruise ship. I'm not on a cruise ship. I'm not on a cruise ship. I'm on a war ship. And I'm knocking down everything I can knock down. Special Olympics oath. Hear me. Let me win. But if I cannot win, let me be brave enough in my attempt. Because I do not want written on my tombstone, as the poet Daniel Wyatt said, when people struggle through the weeds, pull back the moss, and read the inscription there, she made her car payments. 
I mean that. Rather, I'd like it to read something like this. Like the Canadian boy John Geddes. When he went to the New Hebrides Island, New Hebrides Islands, when he came, there were no Christians. But when he died, there were no heathens. Alexandria, look out. You may never join us, but you won't die a heathen. the prophet cried out. I wish somebody had cried out for me. Woe to them that are at ease that are asleep in Zion. Grief to them. Misfortune to them. Adversity to them that are at ease in Zion. And it will be. The angel of the Lord in the days of Deborah the prophetess in the days of the judges said curse ye bitterly the inhabitants of Moroz because they came not to the help of the Lord against the mighty in the day of battle. You're in trouble if you don't join us in this dreadful, grim hour, this evil day when the devil is at his worst. He has come down with great wrath. He's mad. He's furious. He knows his time is short. And he knows his destiny is sealed. And he knows the rapture is close. And he's spewing out all of hell. I'm asking today, is there a prophet among us? Is there a prophet among us that will cry out against our laziness, our coldness, our indifference, our unconcern, our divisions, our opposition, our reproaches? What is hell to fear other than a God called apostolic Jesus name, Holy Ghost anointed men and women with God given authority over all the power of the enemy and a Jesus name, Holy Ghost anointed prayer powered church. That's all that's standing in the way of hell and the devil. That's all that will hinder him. And the church we claim counterpart was born in, lived in, Moved in, had its being in prayer. And that's how they turned their world upside down. That's how they toppled the Roman Empire and snatched souls right out of Caesar's household. Now in this last great outpouring of Holy Ghost revival, God is calling for men and women of soul hot Holy Ghost inspired, hell shaking, world breaking prayer with because, with because of the times 2007, God wants you to learn that prayer is the sovereign remedy for a sweeping supernatural revival throughout the world and for your dead church and dead anything else. I don't care how long it's been dead or how bad it stinks. Prayer has altered the course of nations, changed the laws of the universe, influenced and changed the mind of God. There isn't a failure in our lives that isn't a prayer failure. Prayer is not an option. Prayer grasps eternity and takes hold of the unequaled, unrivaled, almighty God who stands before His universe, unlimited and immutable, and promises, when you tarry in prayer, you shall receive power from on high. Power from on high restricts the devil's power, confuses his diabolical schemes, Pulls down strongholds, obtains promises, snatches souls right out of the yawning mouth of a burning hell. For this kind of prayer, there is no substitute. We'll do it or die. God is not prodigal with His power. He has not excelled Himself yet. It is written in the last days, the people who do know their God shall be what? 
Come on, some man shouted, I'm weak. And do what? How strong are you? You have not because you ask not. That's one of the most powerful statements in all the Bible. Those seven words can change your life, your ministry, your church. Ask of me, saith the Lord, and I'll give you the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. But you have not because you ask not. Shout it at me, ask. ask. Shout it again. Ask. Joshua asked that the sun and moon stand still, so it did, for almost 24 hours. Never before or since because nobody ever asked. There can never be any substitute for asking. So ask big. Pray big prayers. Big prayers turn your big problems into big possibilities. Elijah asked for fire to fall, then poured 12 barrels of water on the sacrifice. He made it as hard for God to answer as he possibly could. Go build your church just right at the mouth of hell and see what God does. Ask that young man that Pastor Anthony brought up here last night. God loved it when he asked big. When you ask big, ask for a whole loaf of bread, not just a slice. Ask for many loaves. He'll send you down as many as you need. If you need a church building, ask for it. If you need a house to live in, ask. If you need a card, ask. Whatever you need, ask. Whenever, all or anything, Jesus said, if you'll ask it in my name, just say, he said to give it to me. Oh, I thought that would do something, but it didn't. Ye have not because you ask not. Erudition, diction, eloquence, charisma, accoutrements, good in their proper place. I love it. But they cannot compare nor can they compete with power from on high. No man is greater than his prayer life. None. To be much for God, you've got to be much with God. For Jesus said, without me ye can do When God lays hold of a man, that man can never be the same. But hear me. When a man lays hold dreadfully on God in the Spirit, groaning, God will say, let me alone. You're getting to me. You're troubling me. You're changing my mind. God said, I'm seeking for those kind of men. I sought for those kind of men. I found him. Elias was that kind of man. Moses was that kind of man. Jesus Christ in the days of his flesh was that kind of man. He groaned. He sighed. And he performed healings and miracles. He groaned twice before he raised Lazarus from the dead. When he saw Mary weeping, he groaned in the spirit. But when he met death head on, he groaned, the Bible said, in himself. Himself, the eternal spirit, the almighty, the creator, the I am groaned. And then he cried, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead and stinking came to life again. A man with these dimensions and challenge and, and can challenge and change a generation. Paul changed the history of the Mediterranean and left a bigger print than Greece, Rome, or Egypt left. They could not stop him or his message. It got past Caesar's secret service. The gates of hell could not and did not prevail against Paul. He said, the gospel I preach, he called it his gospel five times. He said it can shake and topple, but it cannot be shaken or destroyed. It's invincible, indestructible, unconquerable. I ask you, are you that kind of a man? Are you that kind of a preacher? Are you that kind of a, cre a Christian? You say you love Acts 2.38. 
Would you go to prison for never dying hell bound souls? Would you spend a night and a day in the deep for them? Would you enter the arena against Nero, Nero to defend them? Would you be beaten 195, with 195 stripes and three times with rods and be stoned and left for dead? If not, if that's just a little too severe, how about praying and fasting a few days and nights for your family, for your church, for lost neighbors and friends? How about reaching one soul with the truth of the gospel and loving them to Jesus Christ? Hear me. A generation of preachers and churches of this caliber will rescue this generation from the greedy mouth of a burning hell and bring the revival we're all dying for. And if there are any of that caliber here, you better look out, devil. Look out. Brian and Renee Bozier, I don't know whether they're here or not. They ought to be. They have a little dog. They have many dogs. But this little dog is special. They paid a big price for this little dog. I think they flew him in. Last week, he bit into a live wire. When Brian got to him, Brian was teary-eyed. He knew not to touch him. So he grabbed either side of the dog. He grabbed hold of the wires and watched me. He began to do this. He shook and shook and shook until that little dog was shaken loose. Can I tell you that Jesus said, One soul is worth more than the whole wide world. And if the cost of a thing determines its value, how valuable is a soul? I'm telling you today, folks, you better grab your broom and go to swinging. You better get a hold of those wires for your children. And you better go. Come on. No, you're not shook up yet. No, ma'am, you're not. No, ma'am, you're not. If you've got a kid that's lost, you ought to be up shaking. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Not the British, not the Russians, not the Iraqis, not the Iranians. I'm just about through. Because of the times, I wonder what would happen in this room and around the world with those, if they could, join us by the way of the webcast. If we would lift our voices to God in one mind, one heart, one soul, one accord, in soul agonizing, weeping, I mean this, groaning prayer in this place, I believe we could shake Everything that can be shaken. I believe we could shake this very natural plant. I believe this place could be shaken. And we would all be refilled. Say refilled. refilled. With the Holy Ghost. Endued with fresh power from on high. And speak the word of God with boldness and authority. If you will, you will see Him work special miracles through you. Paul, I know... Jesus, I know, but who are you? If your name were mentioned in the regions of hell's damned, would there be anybody there that would know you? So I'm suggesting we all go back. Go back to the upper room. Take your church to the upper room. Go back to Azusa streets weeping and agonizing and waiting on God until... Go back to our knees, back to searching our heart, our habits, our thoughts, our life. Back to pleading, weeping, praying, tarrying, worshiping, warring, witness, and together we will take it to a higher level. And together we will become the uncommon men and women this generation is looking for. And together, we will take hold of God dreadfully and not let go until together we will have the revival we are all dying for and none of us will lack anything.
If that's not the way that it is that I have spoken to you, hurry up and tell me. Because that's what I've wasted my life on. And I don't want to waste my life. So join me in raising your hands and do with this what you will. You just do with it what you will. You don't have to wait any longer to do with it. You don't have to run to this front and fall down on your face. Something's got to happen between your ears and in your heart. And that's where it's got to happen. And it won't ever change if it ever gets there.